trying to get the online to pull up. It's not pulling up, so I can't tell how many people's online. We might have a few. All right, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, okay, so this one's for my soil health journey, um, Tyson Coles. Um, this is a quick bio about Tyson. Tyson is a fifth generation farmer. He farms 630 acres of irrigated and dry land ground east of Idaho Falls and runs 115 cow calf pairs on 198 acres of irrigated and rangeland pasture. He raises wheat, barley, alfalfa, and mixed forages. Tyson has been implementing soil health practices since 2016, which started with cover crops and grazing more cropland acres. He has increased to moving See. Oh, there we go. He has increased to moving to reduced and no-till, as well as testing out interseeding and try to increase crop diversity. He is a supervisor of local conservation district board and trying to make his farm more self-sustaining through soil health practices. We'll turn the time over to Tyson and we'll let him go from there. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. And uh, yeah, I'm just kind of setting up to just walk through what I've done starting out in 2016 uh, with some cover crops and kind of where we're at today and some of the different things we've tried on the farm. So uh, we're going to start off, <clears throat> since there's only two of you in the room, I've got two gifts to give away and you guys get them. <laughs> so I'll start off with that. questions or anything so um, so starting off I'm just gonna hit the soil health principles um, this kind of started guiding me into where we're at initially and I, I did uh, through the University of Idaho extension did a farm management class a couple of years ago and they had us create a mission statement and stuff and my new mission statement was Cole's family farm we're gonna try to to continue to implement the five soil health principles and grow uh, healthy cattle and crops and and since then Ray Archuleta decided to throw a sixth principle at us so this this comes from green cover seeds uh, soil health resource guide and I know Ward Labs you guys do quite a bit with green cover as well and uh, I just got this sent in the mail to me and saw that and okay but uh, Ray says a um, context helps us to understand our ecological economical community and spiritual situations so I as I thought about it and I, I've done a uh, intro to holistic management course online and I was just thinking you know what that really that really fits so it's not just keeping the, the soil covered and keeping a living root in the soil you know stopping chemical and uh, mechanical disturbance and keeping our plants diversified and integrating the animals but now we have to think okay you're in Nebraska you're in Utah I'm in Idaho Jimmy's in Oklahoma Gabe Brown's in North Dakota we do all have different situations we're all starting at different points we have different operations some are larger some are smaller some have cattle some don't so knowing you know our context and what's around us that it, it really is a big part because our starting points are all different we can all end up pretty well at the same spot but the starting points different so i thought that was very fitting and decided i'd just throw that at the front of my uh presentation here so i started out in 2016 um and dad was finally ready to sell the farm uh, i bought part of it and my oldest brother bought part of it in 2014 and i was two years into it and I was tired of my fertilizer bill already. So I wanted to try and find a way to reduce fertilizer <laughs> expenses. So I, I talked to the guys at the NRCS and they told me about cover crops and I said, okay, well that's, that's good. But I only knew anything about the CRP program at that point. And so I was thinking, okay, well I got to plant it and hands off. I don't want that. And they said, no, graze your cattle on it, get some benefit there. And I was like, okay, this, this is good. This might work. So, uh, 
I started into seeding some fall covers after grain harvest and was able to extend my grazing season a little bit and keep a living root in the soil and fix some nitrogen. So I figured, okay, I'm on my way. That'll be good. And so NRCS kind of set up the first uh, seed mix for me and they did a good job from what I can tell. It was a good diverse mix, 14, 15 different uh, varieties, crop types. And so I ordered it from Green Cover. That's, that's who I started out using, mainly because the amount of information they had available online for me to see just on my own time uh, through the resource guides. And pricing wise, you know, it was all the same. I was paying a little more for shipping, but it looked like they kind of knew a little more of what was going on. So they're out of Bladen, Nebraska. So not too far from Ward Labs, really. You're in Kearney, right? So um, I'll kind of go through it later, but since 2020 hit, and things being shut down as far as transportation, I was concerned 2020 of getting my cover crop seed. So I ended up getting some local from uh, Grim Brothers and Blackfoot and then AgriSource actually, who's out here out of Burley for me. I, I've started going with them there. They're a little closer to me and, and uh, they seem to do a good job as well. So I've kind of moved that direction just because they're closer to home. But um, I, I, I've honestly changed my mix every year that I've done it. And uh, not for any specific reason other than I'm trying to address some different problem or adapt to something else. And so I mix it up a little bit for different things. And I do primarily, since this very first mix, I, I put my own mixes together. You know, I, I do ask questions to the seed companies, but for the most part, I've done some research and I just, I just put it together myself. So two years into this, uh, I switched to uh, at least part of the ground to full season cover crop and rotationally grazing my cattle on that. Because I found, I guess back on this uh, last one, I found that I'm, I'm, it's just me running the farm. I don't have any hired help. I've got my kids, but they're a little younger still, coming up, but not there yet. So by the time it took me to get all my grain cut and come back and try to get cover crop seed drilled, uh, just took a little too long. So if I didn't get grain cut and the cover crop seed planted by the third week of August, it seemed like I just didn't have enough growing degree days left to really do anything. If I was into that first, second week in September, I'd get about an inch and a half, two inches of growth, and then it was done as far as above ground. And so if I wanted to be able to graze the cattle, I had to get it in earlier to get a lot more growth out of it. So I, I got looking at it, wheat prices, barley prices, you know, they'd all come down. 2014 was the start of tapering off. 2013 was a good year, um, but by, 2017, 2018, you know, we were holding down in those upper threes, low fours on wheat and uh, pushing down a little bit farther from there. So I got looking at it and it penciled out more that, you know, if if I could get this cover crop mix out there on the cows, I, I'd put pivots on 80 acres behind the house that I could kind of split them up and rotate the cattle around there all year. And the guys at the NRCS thought it would work fine. And I was looking at it kind of, uh, a way to get the manure and the urine out there, kind of prime the soil to then move into rotation of different crop types or something that way. So I had done soil tests in 2016 when I started and then 2018 before I really went into moving the cattle around. And I took it on one specific spot on my north pivot and one specific spot on my south pivot. And from 2016 to 2018, uh, Ward Labs did Haney tests for me. And I don't know how to read them real well. It's kind of look at your CO2 burst for respiration. And I looked at the soil health factor based off of that. And also the organic matter. And I just saw on both pivots a trend that from 2016 to 2018, both my soil health score and my organic matter increased a little bit. Just those two years of doing something it wasn't a huge change, but there was an, a trend line up. So that's kind of what I went off of. And 
I had I'd taken the samples from the exact same spot in the field. I had GPSed them to make sure it was, um, you know, good data. So I'd done that on both those pivots in 2016 and 18. And trying to get the, a mix that I wanted to graze the cattle on again, you know, I went to Green Cover. They had the resource guides, their smart mix calculator online. And so the fourth edition was what I was working on then. They're on the eighth edition now. And each edition has had good information. You know, I love using them as a resource. But I just went through. They kind of had it a spreadsheet layout, listing out warm seasons, cool seasons of both the legumes, grasses, brassicas, broadleaves. And I went through, and I was, at this point, my focus was pretty much grazing. So I wanted something that was going to be good forage for the cattle. And so I just went through and I picked a couple out of each uh, category, kind of mimicking what the NRCS had set up for me, just trying to be diverse. And that's one thing I've learned from workshops that I've been to. Gabe Brown came out to Idaho Falls and did a workshop for us uh, from our conservation district. And that was a big thing he said is just diversity. So I've kind of stayed with that. Everything I've done for the most part has been 12 species or above just uh, different root structures, different crop types, uh, you know, just helps the soil profile all the way around. So I just kind of went through this and found everything that I wanted to put in there. I did put in some facilia and some flax and some soft flower and some different things uh, for the insects and stuff, not necessarily for the cattle. But uh, I figured, you know, if I can get bees and ladybugs and all these other uh, insects starting to come back, that's not going to be a bad thing either. They can they can help eat the, the fly larva and, and help out. The first year I did have, um, I did have some pink eye in my cows, and since then I have not had any pink eye either. So it's as it's progressed, you know, cattle health has been better that way. <laughs> and so this just walked through. You know, I picked a few cool seasons, warm seasons, and everything. And I only planted once. I kind of read that, you know, for your warm seasons, you need to come back and plant them later in the warm season. But uh, the guys in my NRCS district said, you know, we've had other guys plant them cooler and they just kind of hang out until the soil warms up and then they'll germinate and come. So I figured that'd be better because I'd have electric fences strung around and cattle all over. I didn't want to mess with drilling a second time. So here's what I ended up with in 2018. Um, fava beans I really liked. Uh, sun help was really good. Triticale's kind of become my base in a lot of my mixes just because it gets up and grows really well. It comes back well. And I put grazing corn in here initially, but I didn't realize till after the fact that once a cow grazes off the corn, it's not going to regrow. So the corn this year got up about six inches. Then I turned the cattle in and they wiped it out and it never came back. So it was kind of a waste of putting that one in. So I have learned as, I, as I've progressed doing this, but uh, and fava beans, I really liked those. But Idaho does have some restrictions on certain crop types that can't come into the state. Cow peas is one of them. Soybeans is another. Fava beans got added to that list. I was told a, a couple of years ago. I did have a mix last year that had fava beans in it, um, just because I had ordered it, and then they told me, well, it's not supposed to be in there. I just played dumb for a little bit. It's just something with the, I don't know if it's something with those legumes interacting with some of the beans that they grow in the northern part of the state, or I don't know. Because they do dry edible beans up in uh, the northern panhandle. You know, we don't get anything southeastern Idaho that way. But So, I, yeah, I don't know exactly. But they're on the list. And I know we had a, um, I don't know what they call it, it was kind of a workshop, a, a, a meeting with the soil districts around, and that was one thing they kind of put out is from the conservation districts, we're the ones kind of promoting soil health and stuff, that they're going to try to get a list of those to make it more readily available. Because right now you kind of got to get onto the Department of Agriculture's website and find it, and it's a little hard to find the list, but it's the grower's responsibility to make sure they don't bring that stuff into the state. So, so there it's kind of tricky too. If you don't know where to find it, it's hard to know that it's not supposed to be there. So, but uh, 
Here's kind of the layout of the two pivots uh, behind my house there. The brighter red line between three and four when I started this was still in alfalfa. That, that half pivot was in alfalfa. I've since pulled that out. And so I rotate the cows around between these. It's 35 acres a pivot and quartered about eight acres a piece. So I, I've been running the first year, I think there was about 65 yearling heifers and 18 cow-calf pairs that I put out here. And uh, was thinking, you know, red heifers were pretty good at that time. I figured I could buy some heifers, rotate them around with my cows, breed them, sell them as bred heifers. And so we, we jumped into that rotation and I just put uh, still 400 gallon water troughs on each side of the, the pivots as well. And I didn't at first. I only put one on each side that they could access from either of the sides. And there, there's no trees out there. There's no shade. And I found out that I didn't keep enough water to them. I, I ended up losing a few calves uh, that first year to heat stress because they didn't have access to water. I, I, I just have a ball valve coming on the main line right before it goes into the pivot. I come out and water them manually night and morning. The kids go with me because I didn't want any moss buildup or anything in the troughs from rotating them to the other pivot and having it just sitting there full of water so we try to just have the cattle drain it out before we rotate them just manage what we put in but that first year i well actually the first year with the heifers did fine it was the second year where i moved to more cows and calves that i, I lost some cows that uh, had heat stress from lack of shade or anything out there but since i've added a second water trough on each side so i've got one on every corner uh, i have not had any problem with that um, and so there they are kind of around the water troughs. I had people in the previous uh, presentations ask if they kind of compact and trample down right there around the pivot point at the water troughs. They do uh, to an extent. I, I always try to plant through that every year and get a root going again in the fall, but they, they do end up kind of coming back. And right around the pivot point, it's not a real large circumference when uh, the company installed the pivots they didn't even put drops that close i had them add drops because uh, i started out doing winter wheat under there and i wanted it close to the pivot point but uh it it hasn't been an issue you know on the on the rest of the the paddock um so that's that's going to vary year to year as well just based on when everything greens up and starts going i this was initially going to be a short-term thing, three years, and try to rotate them to another place. Um, the way it's evolved, I, I didn't have a place that I felt comfortable moving them. Uh, my brother's looking at putting some pivots in now. Everything else is flood irrigated, and I just didn't feel that I could keep up on the watering on flood irrigated because I'm, I'm trading water with neighbors or whatever else that uh, they're, they're still there and it's, it's still doing okay. But I think the ground needs a rest from that intensive grazing and move them somewhere else and go back into a crop uh, for a year or two. If, if we got everything set up that I had moved places to rotate them, I'd probably do two years cattle, rotate them somewhere else and just keep the cycle going to where they're not on there so far. If I knew I had everything set up that way, um, I might throw a couple of perennials in there to, to keep it going so so they graze primarily from the end of May through end of September middle of October so I've I've rotated them around nine times around those pivots every two weeks essentially completes a cycle and then at that point you know I've got grain harvested I've got other crops cover crops up that they can go graze and I graze my alfalfa fields so um, since we had dairies prior to the early 2000s, um, it just got to where in October for third crop alfalfa, we were tired of putting up good hay one year, black hay the next year. And so we just stopped even doing our third crop hay and we just graze it with the cattle. And that was when we had dairy cows too, around 06, 07, we kind of transitioned to beef a little bit. And so I've just been grazing my third crop. I do cut and haul uh, first and second crop off of there and put up for winter. But uh, for the most part, they uh, they spend all summer out there, and, and it's typically it's typically around the end of May when I do put them in. You know, we have had years, um, 
you know, normal planting date is going to be around that first weekend in April. We have had a, a couple of weeks earlier as far as planting, and this has been spring planted every year. I have not uh, sprayed or tilled this ground since I started putting cattle on it, and so it's going on now the, the sixth year of no till, no chemical, no fertilizer. And I do. Yeah, yeah, and that's part of the transition. I, I've, I've ended up taking more time on this part. Um, some of the more interesting stuff I've been doing is towards the latter part, because that's the fresher stuff. But uh, yeah, I was able to pick up a no-till drill off an auction in Rexburg uh, three years ago that I've kind of been transitioning to that. So I'll just kind of breeze through these. Um, in upping the cattle herd, rather than doing the breeding book and everything, keeping track of everything I did, go digital and I, I have a subscription to an app called Livestock that I pay 50 bucks a year and I keep track of all my cattle numbers. I don't uh, give anything, any antibiotics or anything. Uh, primarily if I do have some calves having scours or whatever I'll treat them but I can at least log it in my app so anytime I treat anything it's logged in there but it'll also keep track of my pastures how big they are and I rotate through and and when I physically move the cattle pasture to pasture I log it in my app that I changed to that different paddock and so right here it's it's keeping track primarily I was planning on two days on and then and then rotate to the next paddock. But again there, you've kind of got to be flexible with how the crop looks, make sure you're not taking too much and uh, leaving enough so that it regrows quick enough to come back. I have had a couple of years that uh, I've probably gotten borderline getting it overgrazed, just weather and water and time and the whole ball game. So it, it's still a work in progress. But here I had kind of an aerial imagery uh, picture going on, showing the whole north pivot was lush and green. That uh, north part of the, the south pivot on the right, it was in alfalfa, so it was greened up. And then I'd just been grazing off. I had just moved them out of that top right corner and put them into the next ones. They were working on that. And then Five days later, so I had kind of rotated around, so you could see as it progressed, the cattle eating that down, and then it starts coming back later on. And throughout the course of the year, I was on uh, 38 days there, and let's see. So I think I, I think for the next one, I took a couple of those days off because it was at the end of the year when I. I fed them or I'd, I'd pulled them in. I did have a couple of times for a week that in the month of September, I would pull them off for a week and supplement them with some alfalfa because things started cooling down, the crops started slowing down, give it an extra week to, to regrow and go back. And then I was able to hit it a couple more times before I moved them out. And so one pivot is 32 days on total. And the other um, was 33. So right here, I've got a 16 rotation, 16-day 16 rotation across the whole 80 acres before they go back. And there at the tail end, it's all grouped together in a larger portion of it. That's uh, that's in September when I had pulled them off to feed them. I didn't change that in the app that I had pulled them. I just left them left them there, so it built up some days. But. During this time, the NRCS came out and they threw some hoops and took clippings and dried it down and weighed it. And so in June, I had about 1,700 pounds per acre. July bumped up to 2,300 pounds per acre, and then in August, it dropped back down to 1,726. So it averaged about 1,900 pounds uh, per acre every two weeks because they, they threw the hoops, took the clippings right before I moved the cattle into the one spot and rotated around. It was just over a month and a half. They came back, took it again in the same spot right before I moved the cattle in again, and then again in August. So um, with that, that equated to 15,200 pounds per paddock every two weeks. So I'd graze it down, move them out, graze others, it would regrow, which was 116 pounds of available feed uh, per animal per day. With that, doing that, the kids got to go hang out with me. 
They found turnips and radishes. They love pulling turnips and radishes. My youngest daughter here, she likes the red clover, picking that and sucking the sugar out of it. And uh, so they get to go out with me. It's fun. We found some praying mantises out there. And we've had a few snowstorms that we've gone out there and watered them into. So a lot of these are just pictures of kind of down the fence line from where I moved them to where they went into and different crop types. So right there, that was that first year for sure. It was nice, lush and green. I had just moved out of the bottom right hand corner up in next to the house. That was the last uh, area that they would rotate into before I've got three acres in pasture right by the house and an acre and a half on the east end that I kind of walk them back up and around or along a ditch before I start the cycle over again. So there's some of the collard leaves. They get nice and big. The cows seem to like them. They regrow well and just some of the different crop types that you can see out in there that I picked out that uh, some of the chicory and plantain and, um, yeah one to two days it, it is kind of flexible just based off of how things are looking with the crop um, you know if they're getting eat, eaten down too much I'll move them out this last year I, I, I went to just I just rotated them every day and it Part of that is because with no-till, no chemical the last six years, I do have some quiet grass and one spot where I've got fairly heavy Canadian thistle coming in, and I feel that that's kind of setting me back a little bit in what I, I'm getting, and so I'm trying to figure out what I want to do to try and address that. So I think I think that has hurt me on, on the tonnage available a little bit, that, uh, that I've rotated them faster to make sure they're not taking too much at any given time. I do have where that one half of the pivot was in alfalfa initially. I sprayed that out with Roundup and then planted cover crops, but there's always some that comes back. So I, I threw out a blow guard block and I, I threw out a, a trace mineral salt block with them uh, all the time. So there are two other spots that they kind of compact for one year, but those I actually move throughout the paddock. They're kind of in the path towards the water trough, but I move those around to try and make sure I don't have any other compaction issues that way and uh, there they are on the ditch bank waiting to go back into it after we completed a cycle they like Jimmy's uh, pictures and videos when you show up they know they get to go get some new fresh feed they love it and uh, they're right there sitting there waiting here's by the house before we're ready to take them around and then down the fence line we'd uh, just been getting ready to move them so um, here's 2019 I did a 18 way mix so again I held up there very high diversity um, and I had another gentleman ask in one of the other presentations if I'd seen some of those crops not come through and not be prevalent in the mix and I have usually out of a 15 16 way mix there will probably be three maybe four that I don't really find in there and I don't know the reason he was wondering if maybe something was allopathic and just didn't didn't like uh, another crop type I don't know but I guess for me that's part of another reason why I keep a diverse mix even if something's not coming through there's a whole bunch of other stuff that comes through that they've got a good variety and like Jimmy showed in his video that the one cow went and she or the heifer she picked out every different plant I mean they they do like the diversity and there again just some of the pictures and Lushness. And again, this was spring planted, so it would have been probably middle of April by the end of May, you know, similar to that 40, 45 day range that Jimmy was talking, then I'd be turning them out. Usually, you know, I'd be 10, 12 inches tall when I'd start and it'd stay that way all year long. I never got the nice tall stuff that Jimmy had, but uh, it's tall enough my dog, he gets uh, kind of lost in there sometimes. He's, he's a German Shepherd about up to my hips I guess so now I do I do graze my alfalfa fields in the fall and uh, I've got another farm about a mile away I'll kind of chuck them to the one end trailer them there then rotate through about five different pastures five fields all the way up and then they're close enough to home I can just road them home so in doing this you know another thing was um, 
get them out of the yards, get the manure out in the field. So I built some freestanding feeders that I thought would work well. I uh, got some metal given to me by a, a landlord on one of the dry farms, and so I built some feeders. And I found out that they just like to congregate around them and eat, and so they end up digging a hole right there next to it. And then flood irrigating, trying to go through that's a real pain in the rear. So I switched to bell grazing just out in the field and forgot the feeders. And that actually works a lot better. Even moving the feeders around, I just pick them up with the tractor, move them and dump a bell. It's still just, you let them sit there in the same spot for a couple of days and they get, but they're digging a hole. And uh, so I can just move the bells out, bell grazing. They clean it up well. Um, I do feed a mixture of uh, alfalfa, triticale, and wheat and barley straw. The straws, you know, just kind of there as a filler, but also they kind of make their own bed in it. So out in a snowstorm like this, you know, I'm not worried about any uh, udders or teats getting uh, frozen or anything that way. Here they are. I was in the yard uh, breaking the ice on the water trough. They can go in and get it as they want. But a couple of feet of snow on the ground a couple of years ago when they were way out in the middle of the field, they could care less. They were fine. The only time they go to the yard is when they know that there's a big storm coming in. Then they'll come in for some shelter. Other than that, they stay out. And uh, I try to, I drop the bells and cut my strings off of it. And then I try to fork it and move it around so it's not just one big pile. Most of that is because I've had some calves get stepped on and die and just trying to spread them out so they're not grouped up so much but after that going to the grazing the other side of the farm you know all the rest of the farm i've still been doing fall seeded cover crops but at the same time if i don't get it in timely enough i i don't really have anything to graze i don't feel that it's been giving me a lot of benefit the dry farm the previous two years 2020 2019 it was either hot and dry and nothing germinated because i had no moisture or it was wet and cold and nothing was germinated because it was 35 degrees <laughs> so i was trying to figure out on the dry land getting something to germinate so i this last year in 2021 looked at interseeding some clovers and turnips and radishes with my wheat and barley and then also i have tried the year prior intercropping some peas with some barley and the peas and barley worked okay it was dry land um, it fared just as well as any of my monoculture wheat and barley that year the biggest deterrent for me was getting it sorted out back after the fact i don't have a seed cleaner or anything so i had the local grain elevator that i sell my wheat to they kind of cleaned it up for me but they just cleaned the barley out of it and then i got the peas and whatever else uh, they cleaned out of that which I'm feeding that to chickens and stuff, but they don't really want it either at this point. If I had some pigs or something, I'm sure they'd clean it up, but I really didn't have an avenue to go with that. It worked fine, but um, I've kind of just moved to interseeding. So right there on the left, I just set up, uh, I was augering some seed out of a bin, and I got a funnel from Cal Ranch and put a ball valve on it and dumped my alfalfa or my clover and uh, turn up radish seed in it and just kind of meter it out and let it mix itself through the auger as I was loading the drill. And uh, in addition to that, I took acres on my brother's farm and I planted a five ing mix, just to mix forages. Cave, beardless barley, um, bursine clover, and I threw some. And then after that, the plan was to go back in with a warm mix just later in the fall. Some fava beans again back in, came back, and pearl millet and some teff grass, and then again some collards and, collards and just some other things. This scenario didn't work as well for me. I had also uh, taken a job as a watermaster on a canal company, and uh, that took too much time. Drops in late and uh, tighter water it just didn't fare as well but they once but not much so i've been the time the last few diversify how can i get more crops i've got wheat barley alpha quinoa and buckwheat later and i'll fall doing some of that the quinoa they want organic i'm not the buckwheat trying to get their 
facility up and going and out of age at the spring of 2021 so it's still in progress um also the same thing on organic and then mustard um a lot on the dry land, do do some mustard. Uh, and this trying to do some oil seed company in American Falls that does the mustard. We'll do flat, flat, me a little better. Your seed, um, my older, so it mustard. So I'm I'm throwing some flax to try to help out. And on my on the right. I, uh, clover, crimson clover, ladino clover, a turnip, a purple top turnip, and then a graza radish, mark winger, winger, um, from the end, try and see, you know, this is what I'm thinking, do you think, he said, yeah, I think it's, they put a radish in it, bolt on you, to keep the seeding rates low, man, and you see, so on the air, five pounds, drive three pounds. It's really, in the end, you know, cut my car from about 13, 14,000, about 3,600. A lot lower seating rate. I thought this might work. You know, we've always established an alfalfa crop under peas and oats or under barley, and, you know, does fine. And then, Haney tests that for any pretty much majority of what they were crop is a legume, and I really well, that it's been diverse, but uh, you know it's primarily been again a cool. We have plenty of those, and I pulled them out in the fall. But then I was seeing okay, well this will get my legumes in there, and so right out in the combine over there's a turnip that was as big as my there in the ground and that where I just cut I have material in I don't want to cut that and I have a header I don't have a stripper header went through and just took up and then I was planning to battle in so that's all the green material that was there right I was through come back and plant and then try to wait for it to come up it was already there you know I there this fall the cattle graze it but it'll be red clover's a perennial and get some nitrogen benefit i did some 20 i didn't do it in 2021 but i'll do it again this next spring to see nitrogen there the big risk like what jill wheat you can't spread so i did a burn down with it around first irrigated i felt it worked fine Dry land, so well. Um, my weeds didn't. It was dry. My legumes germinate. I had a few turnips here and there. But, uh, it, it hurt the dry land a little. Um, but my son, he was out there right after grain harvest, pounding. Was the little knobs on the post, and then we said, yeah. with the overall rotation moving, the cattle's kind of become larger portion of my farm income just through the cat were a little higher and with the drought yields were okay. and then I've been doing I had the opportunity 55 that had been in CRP for about 30 years yeah um two years ago I couldn't get on it till the first of October. By then, it turned off cold. But I did get some. And the main thing that that caught my eye, my until some of the dry rice crops, we just apply weed and summer here. And so my soil health scores, as per the Haney, if I was lucky. This straight coming out of sitting there was at 11. References or in the region. But this, my 
another dry farm. And so me just thinking through that CRP, something should be good. Been disturbed. It was 14 score of what I had on my other ground. I wanted to try and put this back to production. I didn't want to come in and mold board it or dip and reset where it had been going on. The soil while it was. Brad Johnson, who's here, nature could. Yeah, crimper. Great. Up. This fairly wasn't a lot of safe in it, but uh, there were put in CRP at different that different seed there was a lot of grass and some of it for across that and flattened it down and tried to help it so it wasn't so rough and into it and uh, I here's kind of the shot went in and direct seeded and it's similar to this no plane no or no till drill that's in here Mine's got the coulters on a bar up in front of the tank. This in back. But the it's flat out. But in late, you're after the fact. Part and I both found wheat following a CRP. That doesn't do very two wheat, one third of it in barley. Um, this was kind of a test farm for us anyways. I acquired it as say through a program they had donor an additional two years of CRP payment to transition to beginning farmer. I've been farming less than ten years. Farmer. So I didn't have any, I didn't have the Haney test up I needed. That's not that much. I'm just going to, you know, not put any synthetics in it and just see what happens. Didn't work. But next year, I'm accident. So there were some guys in the loose area of Washington that had done uh, some T CRP back to production without. The one guy said he'd done it on four different plots, and he thinks the fourth time he finally got it right. Well, let's so I'll try some other time. But the last time we broke anything out was ago before about soil health and we mold. So um, flax. So at least if good kill, come back back with some grass where the flax. You know. I had chickens. We tried doing some uh, layers. I had a two play round. A repurposed. Old chicken coop, great. The high time and anticipating the chickens would winter in the high tunnel. For recovering tillage addict in me, I rode a till first, thrown down some cover, eat the pre in before winter, and uh, we planted it bare. Three weeks later, green picture on the bottom. It was sitting this tall. And squash, and from the cover crop seed, we had dikes, which is we had thing in there. Uh, there was nowhere for to go straight up, too. And then we had peas down in this stall, and uh, it, it worked out. when we got it in late, it came very well. Uh, a, a female German because my male dog's kind of the cattle dog, very good at it. Uh, he didn't want to tolerate them, but he wasn't going to guard them. And we do have some stuff running around and skunks. So we got a female German Shepherd. And she coming up and was doing very well. Better cattle dog than what my male did. But my male likes the back of the pickup as I'm feeding cattle. You know, I'm still moving. And so she ended up breaking her femur. So we ended up putting her. The chicken thing didn't work. We still have them left. Um, but not that's worth worth anything. And then I have the no-till. We started off on just drills, and then on the drive, this little John Deere air seed. It moved from um, cultivator to it. So in the fall, and then I just come into that. 
that next spring and it did fine but i was trying to get more to no-till on this great plains no-till on an auction in rexburg just north of me uh, i have gps on my tractor john deere 80 uh, it did fine but moving to that great plains no-till maxed out my hydraulic capacity in that tractor handle it uh, I, I pulled the markers off and uh, so that I could just do liquid fertilizer and cut back pass and pass. So plant fairly green stuff. You know, that's some of my uh, rotational grazing pasture area that I plant into in the spring. And then the thing that I wanted to share that I've used hey, that'll help you. Um, green cover, cover, um, and bird. There's probably local seed dealers around here that are doing cover crops as well. But I, I really dove into it. Uh, you know, green cover, I, I like these guides. It has some reason guides. Cover crops, no till farm. Yeah, all their successful farming. I I I glean through you know, a lot of the green stuff. I don't worry about. Doesn't pertain. To it. There is a lot that I found is very good. RCS web, some stuff. The Sarah big. I every one of them there, but pages long with them. Um, and then podcasts and videos. YouTube Green Cover puts out a lot of good YouTube videos. You know, Del Strickler, Keith Burns. That's that's done a lot. You know, if I'm looking at putting something in, a lot of times I'll go to their what they've put out about any specific seed. Um, you know, extension websites. State universities got videos that I've watched. State University, Idaho, years. I've taken a management class myself to learn for an input class and then other local workshops. And then the big, I would say, any other growers or area that are trying similar things, get their phone numbers and bouncing. You know, Cameron Williams that's here, he's down Soda Springs, about an hour and a half south of me. I've talked to him quite a bit, Brad, growers around that are doing it. And so just this thing, I guess, with well, health is other guys that are trying stuff. That's that's it. If anybody's got any questions, best I can. Um, so right, seventy-five cal that I that I do, and it's it's probably the want to be. It's seven acres on so. Cow calf pair. It's and it, it has been kind of tapering a bit now. Five years going on six, and I think it needs to go back. I thought if I can get the my he's he's working on getting pivots put on right now. You know I might go back to a, a corn or something. You know warm season and something that way. I do just just diversity. I uh, another the acres that I picked up from another neighbor last year and had efforts to go with it. <laughs> so this last year I had more the acres as well, and uh, it's been good lush pasture, but grasses don't feel regrow back as well as some of the crop types so yeah I really feel that it does and and that's another thing well there putting them in wheat barley or whatever I've got and chemical costs and harvest costs 
and doing the cattle, I had the seed cost, and that was it. You know, I still came to Bill. I'm, I'm kind of right before they go water and they go out. You know, irrigation costs higher than what my, you know, costs a lot less that way, and I figure the rate higher by having the cattle there. Anyways, that's that's all I've got. I'm actually sorry. I think I went over five minutes the last time. Lost <laughs> questions or where are you guys from? Okay, have you guys been doing much with or soil health to this point, or are you just here kind of? Yeah, learning too. I'm not do all the other. There's a lot to learn. That's that's for sure. And it's, you know, Jill. That's the first time I've heard any of her questions, and she's information that I feel I can use on my operation. And, you know, uh, so, you know, just just meeting new people that have tried different things and been doing stuff. It's anything. So yeah. Well, I guess I'm done. Thank you, sir.